I'm Robbie Thigpen, and welcome to the Sargassum Podcast. I'm Jenna Contuccio. And I'm Francisca Elmer, and we are your hosts for today. We are going to share with you the latest ideas and concepts about Sargassum and Sargassum beaching events, which have become an international challenge. Let's get ready to learn together. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Sargassum Podcast. Um, Jenna and Robbie, I have some really, really cool news, which I found out this week. Um, I was on Spotify um, listening to one of another podcast and I saw that on top you can actually rate podcasts now and maybe also um, music artists on Spotify. So, of course, I went straight to our podcast and gave it a five star rating. And I hope that you guys are going to do the same. And I hope that our listeners who are listening on Spotify are going to check that out as well and give their rating for our podcast. Five stars would be our choice, but you can, of course, rate it the way you feel we are doing. I don't know. Every time I go in there and hear my voice, I want to give it one star. If you just get get that, <laughs> get, get that Southern boy out of there, I think you have a pretty good show. But, but Robbie, what about those amazing guests we have? You want to give them five stars, I'm just, right? I'm just saying that that Southern boy takes a lot of a lot of the wind out of your sails. That's all I'm saying. And uh, get, 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 get somebody <laughs> more articulate. I think you'll be in good shape. Well, on that note, thank you everyone for being here today with us. Tura Homemade is an artisanal agro processing and catering business based in Tobago, which emphasizes local seasonal ingredients. Everything is geared to a healthier, more sustainable lifestyle. Tura Homemade is owned and operated by husband and wife team, Adrian and Avisha. Today, we will be chatting with Avisha Barron from Tura Homemade about sargassum in Tobago and about an agricultural product that she and her husband developed using sargassum. Tobago is the smaller of the two islands that make up the Caribbean country of Trinidad and Tobago. So welcome, Avisha. Hi. Well, uh, thank you for having me. A pleasure to be here. Excellent. I'd like to add that we uh, re really appreciate the support of Seafields and uh, Florida International University's Kimberly Green and Latin American and Caribbean Center for uh, bringing us to you today. And, uh, and, and as Jenna said, welcome. And all, and I, I like to, uh, you know, say that you know I'm ready to learn with you today. I want you to teach me some stuff, and I'm really excited. And so let's let's get ready to learn together. And uh, our first question is pretty much the same question we ask everybody. And what does sargassum mean to you? Well, for me, I am a trained natural resource manager. So when I see piles of anything that's not being used, I tend to think of it as a resource. So when I see piles and piles of seaweed on the beaches, I don't think of it as a natural disaster. I, I really do think of it as a free, available, abundant resource. Uh, we just need to find a way to use it. And so that's what it means to me. It's, um, it's, because of climate change, I believe it's coming in in greater quantities and it's become a seasonal thing annually. So we have to find ways to treat with it and use it. And that's what it is to me, a resource. So you are the first person we talked to who is living on Tobago. So we want to ask you, how is sargassum impacting Tobago? Let us a bit know a bit what's happening on your island. Uh, well, as an island in the southern Caribbean, uh, sargassum affects us pretty much very similarly to the rest of the Caribbean. Um, the Atlantic side of the island is particularly uh, affected. There are piles and piles of it all over those beaches uh, when it's coming in during, I would say, between February and April, any time like that. Sometimes it comes in twice a year. Uh, there are years that it comes in around September as well. And it's kind of devastating for fishermen 
who can't launch their craft. Uh, it clogs up bays. It piles up onto the beach. The smell is awful. Um, resorts on the coast, uh, I don't know how they cope, but even one kilometer inland, you can still smell it depending on the amount that's on the beach. So it's quite impactful, yes. And, and the smell is terrible and yeah. It, it, it clogs up waterways, all the ramifications for sea life. Um, yeah. Yes, and the, the smell is not only awful to smell, but it also means that there are toxic gases in the air that are potentially harmful to people's health. So that, hearing that you can smell it very far makes me, makes me a bit concerned about the health of the people in Tobago as well. The official government stance on it is that it is toxic and that they've kind of, uh, they've asked people not to collect it because of it being toxic. Um, and what they've done is they, they themselves have paid to have people uh, pile it up and remove it from the beaches that need to be used. Um, initially, they were taken, the piles were taken to landfills and later on, uh, it was piled sometimes in agricultural areas in large heaps, but it doesn't really get rid of the problem because it's still in a large heap. So it, you know, yeah. But you came up with a way to use parts of the sargassum to actually make a fertilizer and pest repellent. So we heard a lot about fertilizers before made out of sargassum, but I've never heard about somebody making pest repellent from sargassum. So what kind of pests does it repel? Uh, well, the product is a combination of seaweed and neem. So neem, uh, the leaves of a tree, we combine with the seaweed and we decompose pretty much anaerobically with water. And then we utilize that water diluted for agricultural use as a combined fertilizer and pest repellent. So the seaweed itself is mostly for fertilization um, and the neem is mostly for pest repellent. However, what we found is that the seaweed provides a lot of micronutrients for the plants. And these micronutrients actually allow the plants to create uh, natural biotoxins that help the immune system of the plant to resist pests. So it makes more robust crops and they tend to do better against pests. So for example, a lot of the native fruits that we grow here are not used to their full potential because they get infested with worms, for instance. So fruits like guava and sapodilla get infested with worms, making them less suitable for market. Um, but with the seaweed, because it provides all the micronutrients for the trees and so on, the trees are able to uh, repel these pests. And we find that it increases the amount of usable fruits from the trees tenfold so it's quite a significant impact in terms of the amount of production coming out of these systems that use this product wow that's amazing that's really exciting i, I thought so <laughs> <laughs> um so it took you about four years to bring this product to the market and what were your steps from the initial idea until it was actually ready for your clients? What did that process look like for you? Well, I'm sort of an eternal uh, uh, optimist. So <laughs> I initially, when I heard all of the media around seaweed talking about it as a natural disaster, I was a bit uh, curious because I wanted to know if it could be used as a resource. So I did a lot of research online. I, I have a lot of experience uh, as a researcher 
I used to work for the government of Trinidad and Tobago as a researcher for about six or seven years. And uh, I utilized these skills to do a lot of online research into scientific journals that talked about the use of seaweed as a fertilizer, uh, coupled with the fact that people I know were importing seaweed fertilizers to use on crops that they had here. Things like uh, orchids um, utilize seaweed very well to produce lovely blossoms. So knowing that it can be used as a resource, I thought, okay, let me embark on this experiment, this adventure to find out how it could be used. Um, simultaneously, as I said, we were experimenting with permaculture and organic agriculture. So I wanted to directly use the sagasum in the agricultural field. Uh, so it started off with the research and that took almost a year, just planning and, and looking at the data that was out there. And then we collected the seaweed and started uh, manipulating it to make a product out of it. Uh, the idea was that we would make a product that could that could be used directly by farmers. Something that was low tech and can be utilized by the machinery that farmers already had. Because if we made it as low tech and as, as accessible as possible, it would increase the chances that more people would use it. So if, and we thought if more people used it, then more people would go and collect it off the beach and therefore it would you know, minimize the impact of it on the beach. So we took it off the beach, we uh, soaked it in water with some neem leaves and sort of just moved ahead with as it came. One of the things I, d I recognized is that it smells really bad at first <laughs> and you have to stir it every you know so often but once the smell leaves the product completely it means that the uh, active compounds in the seaweed have completely decomposed into the water and then that liquid can be used as a agricultural as a concentrate fertilizer and pest repellent so what we did was we wanted to test the product for at least two cycles of dry seasons and rainy seasons, which are the seasons that we have here in the Southern Caribbean. And that took two years. So we had to field test it for two years, two dry seasons, two rainy seasons. I wanted to test how the plants and the trees would react when they were uh, facing drier conditions and when they were facing wetter conditions and did it work how did it work? What pests did it repel? Did it boost production, etc., etc.? So that took about two, two and a half years to field test. And finally, I needed to work out the dilution because now I have this liquid, but I need to work out how do I tell a farmer how to use it? So they would want to know how much liquid to use and how to apply it to their plants and how much to apply it to their plants and so on. So to tinker with the dilution, that took about a year, a year and a half. So uh, it, it took over four years to, to get it to this point from seaweed on the beach, research uh, how it could be used, why it's used, how it's used and, and uh, bring it to a form in which I can hand somebody a bottle and say, use this, this amount, this way, this often uh, on these crops. And, and the results have been phenomenal. I mean, uh, I, I, was, I was so present, pleasantly surprised. Um, crop yields went up, the health of the plants in, uh, improved, uh, pests were down. Uh, people were amazed that I was not using 
chemical uh, repellents or pesticides or uh, chemical fertilizers on the plots at all. And um, but I must I must caution though that it does work best in a polyculture system. So if you have a traditional monoculture style agricultural system it's not going to work as well as in a polyculture or permaculture or regenerative agriculture style system where you're working with an ecosystem balance if you're if you're if you are used to using a high amount of chemical inputs it 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 doesn't work as well because the plants are used to the chemical inputs so yeah that that's been our finding Wow, that's so exciting. I'm really happy that it's been so successful. And can you talk to us a little bit about your packaging and kind of um, what you're using to get this product out? Well, this is what it looks like currently. Um, it's an old rum bottle. And uh, we just write the instructions, what it is and how to contact us on tape. And we tape it on. Uh, this packaging means that we save the beaches from some of the pollution that this bottle would have become uh, and also it's reusable so people can bring it back and have it refilled and uh, it's in its simple form now obviously um, and as time goes on we'll refine it and improve it I think that there's no improvement needed. Um, as long as there's enough rum bottles, you should do it this way. <laughs> it's the Caribbean. There's always enough rum bottles. <laughs> Actually, you know, that, that's kind of, um, over here in the Southern Mexico, they uh, had this uh, drink they call Porsche and all, and it's artisanal and all, and it, it costs one price if you have to pay, if you don't bring a bottle and it costs less if you have your own bottle. So I think that's just an awesome way of doing things. So that's great. And uh, um, now you may have covered my question just a little bit. And, uh, and I think you have maybe with your previous question. But who exactly is is or, or, uh, is using your fertilizer and, all, and, and stuff like that? Currently, it's mainly home growers. So uh, subsistence level farmers, farmers who grow for food for themselves and their friends and their families and their communities. Uh, it's been difficult to get mainstream farmers to uh, buy into the idea of using such a backyard style product, you know, something that doesn't look official, something that's not um, promoted by the agricultural schools and things like that um, but uh, people who grow ornamentals for their homes swear by the product people who grow crops for their own uh, use and use of their community come back for the product uh, people from the other island Trinidad whenever they come to Tobago they collect the product to use back in Trinidad and um, they can attest to its usefulness and that it really works to improve their plant health it improves the amount of produce that they can uh, get from the same amount of plants it helps repel pests in the garden naturally and they don't need to use chemical inputs so they can just use their home compost or their um, manure and this product and that's all they need and uh, I'm really really trying to target people who are trying to focus on growing without the use of chemical inputs because they are the people who are looking for a product to use and organic uh, fertilizers are very expensive here the ones that are imported are very expensive so the people who are looking for an organic fertilizer definitely find us and purchase Excellent. Can you hold your bottle up again, please? Can, can you hold your bottle up with the stuff on it? Now, um, I got a couple of questions about that. Um, 
Now you, you're, you're spraying this on the on the plants and all. Is that correct? Or are you putting this onto the ground? Yes. You. So you have to. Uh, what I do is, I try to make things as simple as possible. I, I truly believe. I haven't worked in policy writing. I believe that the if it's very complicated, nobody's going to do it, and it you shooting yourself in the leg. But if it's simple, people are more likely to do it. So when, as a, as a farmer myself, when I'm in the field, it's very difficult for me to measure 10 milliliters. <laughs> so what I, what I did was I said, okay, if you fill this cup, I always do the dilution based on the cup of the bottle. So if you fill this cup, you can dilute it to 10 liters, which is half of the regular spray can that's used here and then you can apply that to one acre of crops mixed crops trees shorter crops root provisions bananas um you name it herbs orchids anything like anything like that so, so this is concentrated and therefore it's simple you're in the field. yes this is concentrated and it, it lasts quite a while yeah, well, that's what I was going to say. It's contrary. So for a, you know, a small, um, you know, farmer or something like that, that lasts a long time. Yes, and, and, and the, the thrust was to make it accessible to farmers and at a cheap price. So this bottle retails for 35 TT dollars, which is approximately five US dollars, and it can go very, very far. So it's far, far cheaper than any other organ imported organic fertilizer. And, and that's done on purpose. Even though it took a lot of labor to bring to market, I really, really, really want to get people to use it because it can improve the health of the people, the health of the island, the health of the soil, the health of the coral reefs, everything. So, you know, yeah, it's a labor of love. Yeah, and, 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 and it make then your mango grow big, 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 true? <laughs> yes, ten pong. <laughs> we have a mango variety that we call ten pong, and it's supposed to be this big. And we also call it belly full because mm -hmm. one mango, your belly full. So. <laughs> Correct. That's amazing. Um, I have a question. Um, so you said in the beginning that your government um, advised against using sargassum and sargassum has a negative connotation. Like most people don't think of it as a resource, but as a smelly thing that they want to be very far away. Did that have, was that, was it difficult to market your product and bring it to the people because of that? Absolutely. Absolutely. It is uh, an uphill battle. Uh, so Sisyphus pushing that stone up that hill, that, that's, that's me. Um, <laughs> uh, but when I tell people that it is used in other parts of the world, they, they get in a little more interested uh, with more and more imported fertilizers coming in that utilize seaweed, they flash back to me telling them about seaweed and they, they think about it uh, differently. And uh, a few years ago, we gave a lecture to the Tobago Agricultural Society uh, and the reception from the farmers on the ground is very good. So the official stance by the government is that it's toxic and they have more or less banned people from collecting it. But as a climate pirate, Francisca, <laughs> you will know that people will do what they need to do. So uh, having gone onto the beach for years to collect the seaweed myself, uh, my husband and I have met many people on the beach collecting it who uh, see it also as a free resource and they use it in their kitchen gardens and they attest to its properties as a fertilizer as well. 
So the idea of it being used as a fertilizer is there. We just need to get the officials in the government to promote it as such. Uh, because then people will, the stigma against it will be turned off. Yeah, I love how you were having a huge smile on the fa on your face when you said how much of a struggle it was. And mostly people aren't smiling when they're talking about their struggles and uphill battles. Uh, that is really cool. But your main business isn't actually making this fertilizer. Your main business is doing catering. So what kind of food can people order from you and what type of occasions do you cater for? Well, I love food and that's what led to uh, this fertilizer because it improves the taste, the amount and the quality of the food. Um, Tura Homemade is, came about as a result of a need for a healthier lifestyle in the Caribbean. Currently, uh, Trinidad and Tobago has a, la a high obesity rate, a high rate of diabetes and hypertension and heart disease. Uh, so we focus on healthy food and we focus on local food and we try to be as sustainable as possible. So every week we do fish and salad, uh, fish, local fish caught here, wild, uh, fresh fish, that's excellent. I would rank the fish we have access to here as the best in the world. Of course, I'm biased, but uh, we have access to amazing quality fish. So we prepare fish boneless so that we can uh, step it up a notch. Uh, a lot of visitors to the island love the fish, but uh, it is usually presented to them with a lot of bones and they have a hard time eating it. So we're trying to make it appeal more to the visitors and, and accessible to the international community. Uh, so we do boneless uh, local fish and salads. And in every dish that I design, we try to use at least 60% local inputs. So we focus on local coconut oil as our cooking oil. Um, we use local fruits, lime for vinaigrettes and um, ground provisions, so green bananas, uh, cassava, dashim, sweet potato, things like that. And that also turns away the public from imported wheat products that are not, you know, nutritionally dense. And um, yeah, we focus on soups and... Uh, things like that uh, we have snacks like samosas and things like that but generally the idea behind the food is healthy local and sustainable and we can basically cater for any sort of dietary restrictions uh, we're not a fancy caterer so we're not going to be for you know weddings and wedding cakes and things like that there are a lot of other producers that do that um, but we're more focused to the, you know, the health conscious local or visitor. And uh, what we found is it's very interesting because it's, it's niche. So uh, the locals who either people who've di been diagnosed with cancer or people who are mature in age and are looking to eat healthier, they find us. Uh, younger people who are looking to change their lifestyle and eat healthier, they find us. Um, athletes, people who need high nutritional uh, inputs and low fat, low carb, they find us people with um, dietary restrictions like celiac disease, people who need gluten free options, who are vegans, vegetarians, they find us people who are diabetic and need sugar free options, they find us. So um, we do food. We also do jarred products such as uh, marmalades, one of our specialty because we use local citrus, uh, jams, tamarind jam, uh, star fruit, chutneys, you know, things like that. We do drinks, so we do kombucha and morbi, which is a local tisan. We do fruit juices 
and uh, we do a couple oils so a natural mosquito repellent uh, a natural neem infused coconut oil for skin ailments and we have have a soap made for us by a local soap maker for to treat skin ailments and that's that's pretty much our range inventory and of course the seaweed fertilizer Wow, I um I think you may have answered my question already, and all, um, because it sounds like you use up to sixty percent local ingredients and everything, and we, you know I I was going to ask you what, what you what your favorite local ingredients are for various reasons, but I might be more curious about what you have to import with this long list of um resources that you have. Um, so yeah, so yeah, because I mean, yes. local food eat good, good, true. So tell me. Yes, real good. Real good. Local food is. Mwah. Um, nice. Local fruit, amazing, amazing. I mean, uh, the the varieties of mangoes and citrus and native fruit that you've never seen or heard of that never leave these shores that are amazing. I mean, you really have to come, Robbie. You have to come, come. And, uh, you know, we'll take a drink, but you have to come and see these fruits and try these foods. But yes, uh, what we have to import, we Trinidad and Tobago is no longer agriculture-based economy-wise. Uh, we are an oil and gas-based economy now. And so agriculture is kind of, petered out a lot over the last few decades uh so we used to have a sugar industry but that has died and uh, so we now import sugar what tura homemade does is if we can't find the ingredient locally we look regionally so we look at our caricom partners to see what they produce and what we can use of their produce so Tura Homemade utilizes Guyanese Demerara Gold Sugar, which in my opinion is some of the best in the world. And uh, that's the only sugar we use in our products. And it's coming in from Guyana, which is close by, so low carbon footprint. And uh, we use salt from Colombia. We use the uh, 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 kosher salt from Colombia. Uh, it's a high quality salt. We don't produce salt here. So I try to find ingredients. So for example, the Moby bark that we use to brew our Moby tisane comes from Haiti. So everything that we, nothing that we can, what we can't find here, we try to look for regionally first. And if we can't find it regionally, then we import from further field. For example, the jars that we use for our products come from Taiwan. They, they are not manufactured anywhere closer. They come from further afield, but what goes into the jar is local. Excellent. Thank you so much for that. And thank you for the invitation. You know, this summer, 2022 marks the 50th anniversary for the Society of Caribbean Linguistics. And the meeting this year is going to be in Trinidad this summer and they haven't sent out a call for paper oh. but I intend to submit an abstract so if that goes through expect to see me this summer and I would thank you so Great. much for the invitation I'd love to I look forward get to over there and see what you guys are doing Excellent. yes absolutely I'll take you around to some of the farms if you'd like and you can see what's happening I would love that thank you so much Robbie, you will have to bring a nice bottle of rum to Avisha or Posh and drink it together. And then once the bottle is empty, you can put some fertilizer in it from the sargasso. And, and I'll bring it back and put yes. it in the mass spec and we'll know what's every, we'll tell her everything that's in it. And I'll, well, Avisha, yes. thank you so much for being with us today. We've enjoyed this a lot. I, I think we've learned a couple of things and I'll, and I hope our, uh, our listeners have uh, learned a little bit with you as, as you've been a very good teacher and all that. And with that, we'll just let you go and we're going to sit around and chat for a little bit, but just have a wonderful day and thank you for your time. 
Thank you very much for having me on. I, uh, I hope that the listeners learn something. I hope that we keep spreading the good message that Sargassum can be used as a resource and it's not just a natural disaster. And um, yeah, I, I appreciate the plug. Check out Tura Homemade and uh, when you're in Tobago. And uh, thank you very much for having me. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you so much. We learned a lot. See you in August. So, what did you guys think? I loved how her outlook on this was so positive. You know, that everything was a resource and she's a naturalist and has a history of being a natural resource manager. It was really nice to hear, oh, I see this thing and I, I know we can use it. And I, that really made me excited. And I like that her product promotes permaculture and, you know, non-chemical use of fertilizers. That was really cool. Yes. And I think Robbie probably is mad at me for taking this. Um, I love her idea of using bottles from the beach or bottles that people use um, to have rum in. Because there's so many people who, who think about, okay, I want to make my stuff sustainable. And then they import some fancy type of new way of doing things. But she just looks around on what's available on the island, what is trash on the island, and how can we repurpose that. And I think that's, that's perfect. Yeah. It's so cool. And you can refill them, which is great. She said the farmers come back and get them refilled, which is amazing. I'm just happy I've got an invitation to go hang out if I get down to Trinidad this summer. That's the best part about it to me. <laughs> And all, and uh, so yeah, yeah. So I'm really looking forward I will, to that. I would be excited too. Yeah, get 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 to hang out with a bunch of Caribbean linguists, and get to hang out with some people that's doing the kind of stuff we do. So that'd be just an awesome time for me. So yeah, watch out for the mangoes, Robbie. I don't look up anymore. And all. Um. Anyway, <laughs> I wanna I wanna thank all of you for being here with us today and learning with us, and all, and uh. I hope you learned something. We certainly did, and uh, we really appreciate you. And uh, you know, you'll find links to stuff we're talking about down here in the uh, in in the description. Don't forget to hit hit like, share us, make a comment. Love to hear from you, and all that. And uh, and with that said, we'll see you again next week. Thank you much. Thank you for tuning in today and learning with us from our guests. If you want more information about what our guests talked about today, check our show notes for links and information in our archive. And don't forget to like and share our podcast with your friends. If you enjoy our podcast, please consider supporting us financially by becoming a patron. For as little as a dollar per month, you can support us and get the exclusive benefit of submitting questions for our interviewees before the interview. The Sargassum Podcast is produced by Marine Conservation Without Borders and is made possible with financial support and consideration from Seafields and the Kimberly Green Latin America and Caribbean Center, U.S. Department of Education Title VI grant. It is produced by Jose Martinez, Alex Danielli, Cleo Maradakis, Francisca Elmer, and Alois Lopez, and is hosted by Robbie Figpen, Francisca Elmer, Jenna Cantuccio, Florence Menez, Cleo Maradakis, and Paula Diaz. We will be back in two weeks with another exciting guest. The music for the podcast is from the song Them A Pray by Drizzle, the round drama, an artist from Rotten. Follow him on Spotify and YouTube for my music. But for now, this is the full song Them A Pray.